I noticed that a good many of the lab, laboratory reports, Sir Ann, and I hope the rest of them you'll get in today or the first thing in the morning. I want to get these back to you on Friday if I possibly can. Um, the laboratory uh, starting on Friday and ending next Monday is a long laboratory. So uh, uh, be prepared to stay for quite a long while. It involves setting up a lot of paired testing and triangular testing, and you will do this yourselves so that you'll have the actual experience. We will not set up the pairs ahead of time, but you will actually have to do them. We've given you now in the laboratories uh, sets of random numbers. If you want to start to making codes and, uh, uh, and so forth, you may, because you'll be doing this for somebody else, and somebody else will be doing it for you. So you'll all have to do that. You might then read the laboratory outline uh, for Friday. Uh, if you have any doubt about how to set up pairs and triangulars, there's a very good section at the end of your Hilgardia, especially written for Hilgardia by Mr. Filippello uh, when he was here at Davis, which gives some very practical means of how to do this sort of thing, putting numbers in a hat and drawing the numbers for different orders of triangles and so forth. If you don't understand it, we will explain it again in the laboratory on Friday and also in the lecture on Friday, but you will save yourself some time and understanding if you read that laboratory uh, outline ahead of time. We didn't quite finish uh, some of the systems of judging last time, and particularly we didn't finish um, uh, the last one, number seven, uh, descriptive types of scorecards. I suppose these are the oldest ones in reality. The old expert judges had their own kinds of descriptive words that they use, and many non-professional people uh, can make quite accurate, and professional people also, can make quite accurate descriptions of wines, especially if they have uh, a little bit more experience. As they get more experience, they build up vocabularies and so forth. Uh, professional tea tasters, for example, may not use paired testing or triangular testing, and so forth, and yet they're quite capable of distinguishing as many as 500 different kinds of teas and making quite adequate descriptions for them without the use of statistics and so forth. The only trouble is you don't know when they're doing the results right, and that's why we have to use statistics in the modern world to make sure that things are uh, what they seem to be. The modern flavor profile dates from uh, about 15 years ago, at the Arthur D. Little Laboratories in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where they were attempting to service a large number of clients in the food industries as to what was wrong with a particular lot of coffee or toothpaste or um, um, bread and so forth. And they discovered that they could train panels to do very highly descriptive analysis. So the basis of uh, the so-called flavor profile is, first of all, a highly trained panel. Uh, who have done a lot of work in a particular product. They take about six months to train a panel on any given product. And they've trained panels on, for the beer industry. They've trained, changed, trained panels for the bread industry, for the toothpaste industry, uh, coffee industry, and so forth. Uh, they have a, a whole six months course, and eventually uh, these people go back and service their industry, and quite successfully. Uh, it used to be, it used to cost $18,000, so it's not a cheap little thing, and they give you an awful lot of experience in recognition of differences and also in familiarity with the product, so that you can provide a, for your, uh, whoever your employer is, a complete description of what the product tastes like, and you can also train panels after you take the course. Now, we rather doubt that any of you will be involved in this kind of descriptive analysis. Usually it's a troubleshooting type of analysis, it might have some use in some wineries where an unknown odor appears. A panel working on it closely might discover what the cause of the off odor was quicker than any other systems that we have. Um, and uh, so that there may be some cases for training panels to do certain kinds of troubleshooting. Uh, the panel is organized under a leader who is supposed to be the most familiar with the product, but he shares his know-how with his panel, and eventually they all talk the same language, almost interchangeably. The perfect panel is a panel where there is no leader, where the leader simply gets the panel started to discussing the product, and you have three, four, five, or six people uh, contributing uh, to the panel. 
The technique is highly stylized. The first things that are done on the technique is to describe the order of appearance of the different odor notes in the product, and also taste notes in some cases. Uh, and you come to a consensus uh, among the different people on the panel as to uh, what the odor note is. They usually draw a line something like this, and they, finally they will agree that the first note uh, is SO2. And so then they have to decide how much SO2 is. Is it a lot of SO2 or not? And so the panel comes to agreement that the amount of SO2 is very high. And so they draw a line from a base point up to, this is not quite the same diameter as it should be, but you get the idea anyway. So they, have, they draw a line. That's how much SO2 there is. That's the first thing they get. And the second uh, odor note that they might get uh, would be that it had a strong muscat odor. And so they would put another line away up there. And then after, they might find that it was a little bit woody. And the next odor note that they uh, could find is that um, it was still had a small amount of yeastiness in the line. So uh, this would be muscat. And this would be yeast. This is wood. Some of these descriptive uh, maps or charts included 15 or 20 different odor and taste notes. Uh, and some idea of the, of the amount of each one was put on the. Usually the ones that are highest appear on the left, but that's not always true. You may detect, the first odor note you may detect may be something that's not present in a very large amount, but may be the one that you're very sensitive to and it predominates over the other one. Uh, there may not be a very much SO2 in some white wines, but I will probably notice that first because I'm looking for it. So they get a time, a study in time, and a study in amount of all of the odor and taste notes in the wine. In addition to that, they get one other overall thing. They get what they call amplitude. This is a sort of an overall quality thing. The amplitude might be like that or it might be like this, or it might be like that. The overall amount of sensory quality is called the amplitude. Well, we'll have a little practice on this. Uh, we'll divide you all into small groups, and you'll have a chance to try it. Uh, and in some cases, it might be the best method. There are two objections to it, two very big objections. One, it, there's no way to statistically analyze these results. They represent a consensus. You don't know how much feed-in there was from each member of the panel, whether some members just went along with the other people, uh, or uh, uh, whether they, they, they were, the compromise represented some very real differences of opinion. They're all buried up in just a few lines like this, and you don't really know the significance of them. However, they have made some studies of panels trained by the Arthur D. Little Company, and then working on the same food back in their own plants. They would send them a case of beer and ask them to make a flavor profile of it. And they got quite similar results. The panels got quite similar results. So under the same kind of training, uh, it does look like to be a useful method of um, uh, describing sensory data, but it doesn't have any statistical method of measuring how significant the results are. The second one is it's been shown that if you have any strong personalities on the panel or people who tend to dominate or like to dominate, that their opinions have a, a disproportionate amount of effect on the consensus opinion. And the way they found this out was that they set up panels, quite legitimate panels, uh, but they had a dummy on the panel. That is, they had somebody that was primed to do something that the, the others would not know about. Uh, they didn't know it was a there was a dummy on the panel. It was a legitimate research panel working, we'll say, on, on um, cottage cheese. I think that was one of the things they worked on. And this dummy member of the panel was trained to say, first of all, before anybody else said anything, there's salt in the cottage cheese. <laughs> and uh, the, every time he did that, salt appeared more often than not over here at the left of the flavor profile. Whether there was salt in it or not, he just said there's salt in the cottage cheese. And um, so that indicates that there is some uh, foreign influences. Now, that, the people at Arthur D. Little say, well, that's a completely 
extraneous result because our panels are all taught to work together. There's no dishonest people, there are no dummies on any of our panels. That may very, may very well be, but if you've tasted with any strong personalities that, uh, now we've had some in classes too, that, uh, and some people say I do it sometimes too, uh, uh, you'll soon get the idea that um, they can have an influence and they do not easily give up their opinions even if they're demonstrably wrong. All right, now I'm going to talk on the outlines that I've given you today on lecture four. This would, should really have been the first lecture and would have been except that I wanted to get you started on systems of analysis. And, and, uh, but now I think we're far enough along that I really have to say something about the source of information. It seems to be the only one of the four courses we give where this material fits. I did give in 123 a description of the different places where you can find information on chemical and physical analysis of wines, and uh, we had a short part of one lecture on that. Th these are general ones for enology, and as more particularly as related to this course, and I am going to do something a little different than I've done before. I'm going to uh, not only say something about each one of these, but I'm going to indicate what their major ways of viewing, uh, using them might be. This fits in with the Amarine philosophy that the educated man is not the man that knows the most, but the man that can find the most with the least loss of time. And uh, none of you can learn everything there is to know about wine in one year or two years or three years or even a lifetime. But you can hope to find out where a lot of the answers are. And this lecture is intended to supply you with information on where to look. So you'll see that the first part is on books. And I'll give you some information on other books too. Second part is on where to go in the library, the kind of things to do there. And then I'll have something to say on in rather general at the end. The one of Amrine and Joslin was the second edition representing the revision from the 1951 edition, 20 years later, uh, uh, made more general, uh, two and a half times bigger than the first one. It has a fairly general and broad description of wines of the world in the first hundred pages. Quick dash over, few spelling errors, it's going to be reprinted next year without very many changes except the spelling errors are going to be corrected. Uh, it has um, a fair description of the statistics of the California wine industry up till about 1968. It was out of date when it was published. It then takes up in a, a fairly detailed uh, amount of information on yeast and microorganisms involved in winemaking, something as to the chemistry of fermentation, uh, a fair amount of material on uh, winery sanitation and winery equipment, a fairly large amount of information on analysis of wines, that is the chemical analysis of wines, the amounts of different compounds, and then some fairly short chapters on making different kinds of wines, a fairly good chapter on chemical analysis with the less material on sensory analysis than I would like, but still useful to look over, represents a slightly different point of view than others, and then a fairly good chapter on the legal aspects of the California wine industry. For you, the, we have given you, illegally I might say, without permission of the publisher, a Xerox of Appendix A of the uh, Table Wine book. And you have been given these in the laboratory either last Friday or you will be given them today and some of you have them. It's a selected and classified and slightly annotated list of references. Uh, and it's divided up into sections a general section, which I'll have something to say about last today, which runs to several pages, a historical section, which I will not talk about very much today, section on analysis and composition, which is self-explanatory, another section on microbiology, a section on bibliography, which has some useful material, one on winemaking, uh, which is also fairly general, and uh, there's, uh, that in, ends the material on the, in, the, in the selected list of references. Uh, 
there, the index is what I particularly want to call your attention to. It has a very large amount of information on, um, uh, on all kinds of things. Uh, it's perhaps too highly organized. And some people find it to be difficult to use because there are so many sub-entries. However, after it was made, we spent an extra several days re-indexing it to break down the big entries, and so none of the entries are really as long as they were at the start. Appendix uh, B in the um, uh, Table Wine book has to do with journals arranged by country, and they also give you information about what's in the journals, whether they're technical or popular, whether they contain material on viticulture or material on enology or both. Uh, not all of the journals are in our library, but they, we've reviewed them or had them here, or I get them personally, or for one reason or other they were included in the list of, uh, of journals. They can all be gotten nowadays through interlibrary loan, uh, even if they have to go to, to Moscow to get the reprints for you. And the last uh, appendix, which most people don't see, and then they come to me or somebody else in the staff, they give you a list of experiment stations in various countries of the world and their addresses. And they also, in, I believe, indicate something as to the nature of the research that they're doing. Uh, those of you who are visiting European uh, countries and who need information about where to go, that's the first place to look. Uh, there are some 20 experiment stations listed for France alone, and seven or eight for Germany, and three or four for Italy, and so forth so that it's a very useful compendium. The second book, the uh, Amrine Berg and Kruse Technology of Winemaking book is a more general book. It was, uh, it's the third in edition in this format, but it really represents the fifth edition of a book of Professor Kruse's, original book of Professor Kruse's, uh, called The Principles and Practices of Winemaking. The first two editions were published just before and at the end of the war. Uh, it then ran out of print and Professor Cruz prevailed upon me to help rewrite it. And he eventually died and Professor Berg and I have written the last, uh, the third edition and also most of the second edition. Uh, it has some references that the Amory and Joslin book doesn't and has some information that they do not have. The tables have been brought up to date. The third edition for 1972 uh, is, um, um, has references into 1969 and 70, and I believe even some 71 references. Uh, and the tables have uh, production data for California for 1970, uh, and I think some cases in even 1971 estimates. Uh, the legal section is perhaps better in this one than it is in the table wine book. Uh, and I think the winemaking sections, perhaps reflecting Professor Berg's interest, may be a little bit more complete in the technology than they are in the table wine uh, book. They were started out quite different reasons. I won't go into the reasons why they were two books were published instead of one. The uh, table wine book is really a attempt of the university to speak with a sort of united voice to the industry from all points of view in the university and it comes out of Bulletin 651, 639. Uh, the Amarine, uh, the Joslin and Amarine Dessert Appetizer and Related Flavor Wines comes out of Bulletin 651 and is a publication of the Division of Agricultural Sciences. Uh, so it's not a UC Press book, although the format is exactly the same and the illustrations and topography are the same. It is of the books that I've been associated with the one that is perhaps most highly refined uh, that one we had at the moment when we wrote that in 1965, uh, both Professor Johnson and I, a lot of facilities, and uh, I think we made less mistakes in that book than the other. It has a general references as well as uh, specific <coughs> references, and uh, the information on vermouth, for example, cannot be found anyplace else perhaps the best description of vermouth production in English, better than the one in the Amory and Bergen Cruz. The only things that I would say about that book is that if it were re be redone today, that we would have a lot more material on flavored wines than we had. But after all, in 1965, there weren't a great many flavored wines. We were only seven years 
uh, after the law had been changed that permitted the production of flavored wines. So that uh, I think we could be excused for that. You've been given the Amarine Wrestler in Filippello, and uh, however, um, there is a fair amount of information in that book, and you, had, you ought to not take it just um, the references that I give you, but uh, manage to read it cover to cover at some stage during the quarter. The practical part, the most practical part, is at the end, where the actual methods of setting up an experiment are outlined in some detail. It's on this point that students most often fail. They can take data that somebody else has collected and analyze it, but they have a hard time collecting data themselves, setting up a test. When our students go out to wineries and the boss says, well, let's do a triangular taste test. They all get nervous and panic. They sometimes get nervous and panicky because they don't actually know how to do this, the actual setup. So we are going to do that this Friday and next Monday and it also tells you how to do that in the Hogarty. The principles of sensory evaluation were written for another course. They do not refer directly to this course, except one or two questions can be answered there. One of the questions is in your first lab reports, I find, they believe they're here, which did have some more sugar and acid thresholds than you could find any place else. Uh, so that was the reason that reference was given there. All you had to do was open for thresholds and look up sweetness or look under sweetness thresholds and you could find the answer. The uh, Owen Baker Hilgardia, I don't think we actually put it on reserve. You will not need to use it, but it's something that will be worthwhile with respect to this course because it gives you a rationale for the small panel testing. We would like to give you out the uh, list of bibliographies and a selected list of publishing publications that contain bibliographies, but we are forbidden by the Department of Finance from so doing, by the fact that they have put a charge of a dollar and a half on it. Uh, you may see a copy of this. It's about 30 pages long, I believe, or 40. It represented everything that Dr. Singleton and I could collect from as many sources as we could as to where bibliographies are included, that is, the references to the wine literature. And some of them are very long and uh, very extensive. For example, uh, most of you wouldn't know uh, offhand that there is now in the library in 72 volumes a list of all the publications that are in the National Agriculture Library in Washington. By going to the section in SB 387, 388, you can get information on all the books that the National Library has in viticulture. And by going to TP, 500, you can get all the books on uh, enology that are contained in the National uh, Library of Agriculture. So that it's a very useful document. It's in the main library. And there are literally a hundred or more other bibliographies of that kind that have information that at one time or other can be and may be of great value to you. At least you should know where it is and how it can be obtained in case you need to do it. Now I want to look at these um, uh, little um, selected and classified list from Appendix A of the Table Wine book and make a few comments on them. If you don't have one of these available now, you can simply put the man's name down and later on refer to them. The uh, first book by uh, Leon Adams uh, is a very general book but represents uh, as close as anything else the official position of the California wine industry vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, what wine quality means in California and what to think of the wines of California in comparison with other wines. I don't always agree with all the conclusions, although I wrote the introduction for the book. It reads very well and easily, and it might be an exercise in... Uh, critical evaluation for you to look through this book sometime when you're in the library in the TP section, I-48 I believe, uh, and see what you agree and don't agree about uh, his point of view. It was written eight years ago, maybe somewhat dated in some respects now, but it has some very useful information, especially for anybody going in the wine selling job, be useful. The Allen book on Portuguese wines offers nothing. It has that 
what I have to say down under C, general text, generally uncritical. The same thing is true of the popular articles on South African wines. There are better ones than that. The two little articles of mine, one on the Soviet Union, is, that one is, I think, fair. The one on Japan is not very useful. There's not enough information available. Those of you who did not have Bit 3 should read The Wine Introduction for Americans. The greatest book perhaps ever written on viticulture and enology is at the bottom of page one. It's called The Babel and Mach, B-A-B-O and Mach, M-A-C-H. They started in 1857 to writing this book, and the final edition was finally finished in 1927. So they took 70 years to write the different editions with the help of various authors and their sons and grandsons and so forth. Uh, it's really a true classic. It will probably live as long as the grape and wine industry lives. It's almost, I might say, worth learning German for in order to read Babo and Mach because they knew everything there was to know about the grape and wine industry every place at the time they wrote it. And uh, they were critical, as critical as they could be at their time. The only trouble is they wrote 19th century German and they published it in 19th century German script and it's hard to, hard to read unless you're very familiar with it. Well, the translation, that's easy. You never have any problems with that. It's, uh, German is actually, uh, should be as easy to read as uh, French for you because uh, it's uh, more like, um, it's more like uh, English construction than many French, uh, they don't put the pronouns in the wrong place and so forth like the French do and the Spanish do too. Well, let's skip over uh, Bodhi and Bozdari. The Bozdari book is a popular book on the wines of South Africa, but uh, worth taking a look at, small book. Um, the Bruni is the first of a number of books which are coming out. There are several recent ones now on uh, trying to update Italian wines. Uh, the Italians have never been very fair to their own wines. Certainly I haven't. And uh, they have never had uh, their wines classified. Uh, they've never had any protected labels. The one on Chianti sort of failed in the 1920s. Uh, even under Mussolini it failed. And so only recently, as the common market came on, have they began to classify their wines and to discover that some wines are not very good and some wines are better. This... Professor Bruni's book is one of a whole series of these now. There's some ten of them, I think, all together. Uh, the second, the one right after that, Capone's book, the Vini Tipici e Prigiati, that, that means good quality wines and typical good quality wines of Italy, is the same sort of thing. They're both popular and they have the same kind of information. The book of Chapez is a, is a, a great classic and one that I recommend that you look at very uh, Carefully, Chapaz himself was a champagne maker, and this represented his life's work uh, when he finally got ready to retire. Uh, he wrote everything he knew about the vineyards of champagne and about how to make champagne. Uh, everything that he said, uh, he had had personal experience with. He's not writing something that he didn't know about. There isn't anything in English, Forbes or any of these other modern books by English writers uh, that even approaches Chapaz for authentic words of wisdom on champagne. And he's not taken in by the widow so-and-so who tastes all the wines and uh, rides a bicycle and uh, things like that. Um, he looks at wines pretty authentically. The Coq Ferret, there's a new edition now uh, out. Uh, 1970, I believe, the 13th edition. Uh, it tells everything that there is to know about the vineyards of Bordeaux and about the wines of individual vineyards from the vineyard's point of view. Coq Ferret is not critical. They take whatever the winery wants to say. Chateau Margaux makes wines that are very harmonious and well-balanced and bouquetted, etc and they print it exactly that way. So it's really a catalog of public relations releases by wineries, about 3,000 of them all together, 3,000 named vineyards in the Bordeaux region. In some cases, there are pictures of the chateaus or the vineyards. 
uh, included, uh, quite frequently a copy of the label, and sometimes even a uh, picture of the cork and how the cork might be branded at different times. Even some historical material is given about the wineries and the vineyards and so forth. It's um, always out of date, when it, even including the last edition, which is only two years ago. There's a pretty good article in um, Newsweek a week or two ago about the effect of the wine explosion on the wine the vineyards of Bordeaux, which verifies this. Uh, uh, vineyards which a few years ago man would be asked 250000 for we turned down a million dollars this year from a German firm uh, that the Japanese and the Germans and uh, English and the Americans are buying vineyards as fast as they can uh, in the Bordeaux district and the prices are getting higher and higher and, uh, and if you haven't read the Newsweek article those of you who are interested in the future of wines should read it just within the last couple of weeks because they predict that there is a bubble someplace. They don't say where or when, but they say there is a bubble coming. Um, and, and they give some reasons for it, too. All right, uh, Cosmo is, has uh, some material on Italian wines, and he's a very honest man, and I think he's useful data on production of wines there. The book of Cox on the wines of Australia is fair. Forbes's book on champagne is, um, he drank too much champagne while he wrote it. Goldschmidt's book uh, is an old book now, but still uh, useful for describing the history of German vineyards. Uh, but the arrangement of the vineyards have all been changed since 1951. And Grossman was never very useful and isn't any more now than it was. If you need to know something about Hungarian wines, wines Halas's book in English is worth looking at. Hogartens are wine merchants uh, in London, uh, and they've written a, a, a new book now on Alsace, a uh, revision of the old one, and I think they are also coming out with a new one on the Rhine. Uh, they're, they're quite enamored of these wines. After all, they grew up there and so forth, but they're also quite critical. They know the difference between a good wine and a bad wine. And so I think that although I've listed them both as popular, I would say popular but authentic if I was doing it over again. I think the best title of any book ever published on wine is the one of Maurice Healy. Maurice Healy's book says, Stay Me With Flagons. Does anybody know where that phrase comes from? I think it's a biblical quotation. It means, or if not a biblical, it's a Shakespearean quotation, which is like the Bible, I suppose. Um, Stay Me With Flagons means hold me up with wine. Flagons of wine. Hold me up. Maintain me. That's what stay me means, maintain me, keep me going. It's uh, an Irishman uh, seeking out lost causes in wine and then saying that he's found the answer to everything. He liked the 1910 vintage, which nobody else liked. And he spent most of his wine lifetime trying to convince people that the great wines were made in 1910. The J. Walter Thompson Agency publishes each year for the KWV, the big South African wine combine, a survey of wine growing in South Africa which gives the latest data on production and quite frequently data on equipment and winery procedures and grape varieties and so forth. It comes out every year and uh, it's uh, uh, quite useful. The pictures are lovely. I wish we had a uh, public relations agency for the California wine industry that did as good a job as the J. Walter Thompson Agency, which after all is an American agency, does for the South African wine industry. I don't expect anybody here to read um, Croatian, so we'll forget the next one. Uh, professor Roger is a, Roger is a uh, professor in uh, uh, an English college, a French college, and he has uh, written a book on the Bordeaux wines, both in French and then translated into English. It's popular, but he likes some chateaus and he doesn't like others, and his prejudices show sometimes. We still list Schoemaker and Marvell after all these years. They wrote this book in 1934. They uh, predicted then there would eventually be a shortage of wine in California. And everybody said... Uh, for, you know, see, 36 years, well, gee, they didn't know what they were talking about. Now everybody's eating crow and schoonmaker who's still alive is saying, see, I told you so, 
that we'd have to import more wines from Europe to take care of the American thirst someday. He didn't. He thought it was going to be in 1935 that he'd have to do that. <laughs> and he went into the importing business because that's what he really believed was going to happen and stayed in the importing business and still is in the importing business. But his prediction in 1934 has eventually come true. I suppose that's true of most prophecies. If you just wait long enough, <laughs> come true. <coughs> Now, Shan's book is a reprint. I don't know how much Mr. Shan had to do with this edition or not, but there are a lot of very good things about Shan. He, he went out and looked for wines. He didn't just read other book, people's books on wine. So it represents a real contribution to the wine literature. Most of you know who Andre Simon was, A.L. Simon, S-I-M-O-N. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about him, and then you can appreciate what his achievements might be. He was a wine merchant for 32 years. Uh, he was the world agent outside the, uh, for the British Empire, he was the agent for Pomeroy Grano Champagne. Uh, an agent serving the British Empire from uh, 1900 to 1932. This must have been a very lucrative position. Uh, it was the time that the British Empire was at the height of its power and money and uh, he didn't have to really go around the world selling wines. In fact, he only made one or two trips during that whole period of time to sell wine. In fact, he stayed at home during that period of time and spent his spare time writing books on the history of the wine trade in England and the history of the champagne trade and lived the life of Riley, as near as I can tell. And then suddenly, when Mr. Van Rubentrop came into the picture in 1933, the Pomeroy Grano people were gradually taken over by German interest and uh, Mr. Simon lost his position for obvious reasons, and he had no job. It was that simple. And uh, so he had to do something else. He organized the Wine and Food Society, and then he really started into writing books. And he, altogether, he wrote nearly 100 books of varying degrees of completeness and so forth. I recommend that you read some of these. We have practically all of them in our library here at Davis. Uh, the... Um, the, uh, the introductions themselves are quite worth reading because they give his philosophy. He seemed to me to be the most moderate of wine drinkers. He, his menus are not like some that I see from modern wine snobs and so forth. They want to drink ten Chateau Lafitte's at one time or, or they want to have six 1934 wines at one dinner. Nobody can do that and really identify and judge the wines. There's a great tendency to do too much of this sort of thing uh, particularly while they're eating and drinking. Now, if they're spitting it out, it's another matter, but I've never seen any wine taster yet that would start spitting out Chateau Lafitte 1929. <laughs> so most of his dinners had to do with uh, one white wine and one red wine, or uh, sometimes a glass of champagne, uh, white wine, and uh, two red wines at the most. Uh, and they were modest uh, arrangements of food and so forth. Uh, just take a look at them. There, we've only given you four of these books here, but there's another 75 or 80 of them, five of these books here. Uh, one book that you can all read, and since you can't read, uh, some of you at least don't want to read French, you'd better read Thudicum and Dupre. Uh, it shows what people can do uh, who uh, uh, are amateurs. This was not written by professionals. Mr. Thudicum was a neurosurgeon. He was really interested in operating on people's brains. And Dupre was one of his assistants. He had, uh, he, he operated in London, and uh, sometime along in his life, 1872 to be specific, he decided to write a book on wines. And uh, it's a big book for the time, 760 pages. He had obviously read a book by Mr. Julian, a French writer of the 1860s, which classified the wines of the world. But uh, Thudekman took that, uh, got a, collected a lot more information, and it's the only in the, the beginning, uh, really, of the classification of European wines. He classifies all the wines of the world into first, second, and third quality. Now, that was a French idea 10 years earlier, but uh, imagine being a college teacher, a uh, practicing surgeon, and on the side write a 760-page authentic book on wines of the world. Well, there are some people who can do everything, and he seems to have been one of them. 
Wagner, uh, that's a good book on Amer Wine Grower's Guide, and he has another one on American wines, which is equally good. And Professor Winkler's General Viticulture, I can't praise too highly. On the historical things, uh, most of you will not need those, and I will skip those over, except to point out that Penanu and Greenleaf have started uh, in the three volumes they've published to doing some useful things on California. One of those is a history of the Italian Swiss colony. Uh, another one is a, has something to do with the California Wine Association. And that directory of California wine growers and wine makers in 1860 has a lot of information that came out of the Cessors list in Sacramento and so forth and tells you which wineries were actually operating in California in 1860. So when you see some of these things that say that we were founded in 1832 and that you read that and get the real data. Something else again sometimes. Um, I guess I should comment on Younger, the last one of the history one, and the one at the top of that page, Caroso. First Caroso. Caroso was a doctor student in Berkeley in about uh, 1948, 49, right after the war. Uh, under Professor Hicks, who was a great history teacher. And although it wasn't Hicks's specialty, uh, Caruso proved to be a very good scholar. It contains more information on the early history of the California wine industry than any place else, and more authentic original source material. If any of you have to write about the California wine industry, you go to Caruso and read Caruso first, and then you read his sources of information second because he has found all kinds of sources of information that you would never imagine. Journal articles, the whole Bancroft Library files, the Harassi files in the Bancroft Library, and so forth. A lot of information that's not available anyplace else is given in the back part of Caruso. Most people who write about the California history, the California wine industry, don't know that. It's a good place to look. And Penanu and Greenleaf are a good place to look. Younger, unfortunately, was a young historian also. He got interested in the wine industry and uh, wrote this quite good book called God's Men and Wine, a big book, 500 pages long. And then just as it was in the galley proofs, he died. His wife read the proofs and finished it, but he would have written better books, I think, after he got the criticism of the first. It's not free of criticism. It has a lot of very useful information in it. The microbiology and sanitation section would now have to be revised Oh, well, first of all, uh, the um, a little review of Dr. Kunke and I in the um, in, uh, annual review of microbiology is pretty good on, on, on yeast and bacteria, but there's an even better one now available in the book on the yeast, just on yeast, by Kunke and Amarine, a uh, quite good review of the present use of yeast in the wine industry and so forth. And of course, Lauder and Krieger Van Riesch have, um, that book is out of print and has been, and there is a new book out now by Lauder alone on the yeast, which is um, very much better and it gives a great deal more information than we've had any time before. I understand that Professor Shondell is revising his microbiology of musts and wine, so we can expect to see that in the near future. There's also going to be a symposium on yeast and bacteria this May, in honor of Pasteur's 105th anniversary, and there will surely be a book coming out of that on wine yeast. Bibliographical material is better summarized in Amarine and Singleton, so I won't say anything about that. Some dictionaries are better than others, and let me look. Now, um, I guess I have to say that Lachine's is all right because uh, he says I helped him. Uh, but I would say that Schoonmaker's is probably as good and much easier to read. It's not as big as Lachine's. It doesn't go into as great a detail as Lachine does, but uh, Schoonmaker writes better. He writes like an angel, even though he isn't an angel. That's about all I'll say about dictionaries. The legal and statistical things, I don't think I need to go anything further on, and the winemaking things, I will not say anything further about. That belongs in another court. Now, where to go in the library? That's uh, what I want to spend the last 10 minutes on uh, here. Well, people just won't use the card catalog. Now that we have a subject catalog as well as an author catalog, 
they're separated in the library. How many of you knew that the catalog was separated last spring? All of a sudden, they separated out. And uh, we, now we have a subject catalog over on the uh, west side of the, of the room and uh, the author catalog on the other side. Learn to use the subject catalog. Whenever you go to the library, start with the subject catalog, unless you know exactly the author you are looking up. Then you go to the author. But other than that, go to the subject. Or you go straight to the stacks. And as far as enology is concerned, it's in TP. Uh, there is some things clear back below 545, but the main uh, thrust of enology is 545 to 548. Then go downstairs in the first floor to the Bibliography of Agriculture, which goes back about uh, 30 years now. It is the greatest collection of information on, um, on um, uh, agriculture in the world. There's nothing like it anyplace else. It's not abstracts, however. It just has subject indexes. And it's quite hard to use. And one or two years, they forgot to publish the subject index. So it's not complete for all of its years. And there was a long period of time when, at the beginning of the present administration, when uh, they tried to get the federal government out of the publishing business. And it took about two and a half years to do this. So we have a break uh, from 1969 to 70 before they got started again in 71. It's now being privately published, the Bibliography of Agriculture is. But it, um, it takes you immediately to all the world's literature about grapes and wine. And there, there's nothing else in one thing that's like it. If you're looking for wines alone, the food science and technology abstracts are quite good. They, are, uh, they cover particularly alcoholic beverages, and they have quite a bit of material on sensory evaluation. Uh, it's rather unique. It's American money. It's uh, published in Germany, and it's edited in England. Our own Dr. Stewart is on the board of uh, that uh, runs the food science and technology abstracts. And the abstracts are quite good. They're uh, complete. They're done by professionals. Uh, the British do the editing, and they do a very good job indeed. The same type of thing is done in horticultural abstracts for the grape industry, uh, coming out of essentially the same uh, complex of organizations that do food science and technology abstracts, also do a British government publication called Horticultural Abstracts. Uh, their abstracts are very short in many cases, not as good as the ones in food science and technology abstracts. If you're looking for a rare vitus plan or something like that, then biological abstracts is your place to go, or a rare new yeast you'll find in biological abstracts. It's very good on taxonomy, but not very good on other things. Chem abstracts, of course, is the most essential adjunct that any wine library can have. Because in a moment, you can read anything from 1895 to date uh, in English uh, from all the languages of the world. They, um, it's gotten bigger and bigger. They have annual indexes. And they have five-year indexes. And at one time, they had some 20-year indexes. They don't have those anymore. So that in a short period of time, if you're interested in the antimony content of wine, you can go to Chem Abstracts and you can get all the references and abstracts of all the material on antimony uh, content of wines at one quick time. The Index Medicus, suppose that somebody wants to know what the antimony results of drinking wine with antimony is. Well, then you would go to Index Medicus. This comes out of the catalog of the Surgeon General's office from about 1870 or something like that. It was published by the Surgeon General's office for many years. The title then changed. It went to the National Library of Medicine at Beltsville, right across from the big Navy hospital there. Uh, it's a good place to go because they have a very good system of getting uh, journals and so forth. And you use the index only because it does not give the abstracts. And uh, if it has to do anything with any medical implications of any kind or the human body, anything about the human body, uh, or even animal bodies in some cases, uh, you'll find it uh, listed there. Well, and now let me say in general that most of the general popular texts are just that. They're general and popular. Uh, they almost are out of date when they're published because they, it's like writing a guide to restaurants. Woe be if you ever do write one because the day you publish it, they'll change chefs on you. 
and uh, or they'll have a new price policy. They've upped the prices 50 percent. Uh, it's almost impossible to write a critical, up-to-date book on any kind of wineries. They're changing hands rapidly, particularly at the present time. Their policies are changing. Wineries that were good yesterday are better today. Wineries that were better yesterday are worse today. Wine promotional material, well, necessarily it has to be uncritical. They're not going to say something nice about their competitors. That's the only way you're com critical is when you compare something. So you don't expect winery A to put out and say, we have the best Cabernet in the world, and compared with winery B's Cabernet, theirs has too much acid and so forth. They can't do that under the laws of libel and other things. And so you don't expect them to be critical. I haven't written anything on it either. Wine merchants' catalogs, well, they're most often misleading. They say, taste our nice, soft Chateau X, 1963. Woe be to it if you do so. I have some lecture outlines from... <laughs>